typically a hybrid meeting with some individuals participating remotely while others are participating in the boards and commissions room at Seattle City Hall. Um, we will move on to the color brave space norms. Um, I would like to invite a fellow commissioner to choose and briefly speak to the relevance of one of these color brave space norms to today's agenda. Do we have a volunteer today? Oh, Monica, I see you're unmuted. Could yeah. I ask, could, would you be willing to pull one forward and speak to it? Yes. <clears throat> um, I'm going for green. Um, look for learning and commit to learning in public. Um, I think this speaks to me in a lot of different ways, and I think it speaks to our collective work in continuing to challenge ourselves to grow um, and be open to learning new truths. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Um, if there are no amendments or modifications to these color brave space norms, I suggest we all agree to use these today in the course of our discussion. Um, on the agenda today, we have two items. So the first is an update on sub area planning efforts. Um, that are underway that are being led by the Office of Planning and Community Development. Following that update, we'll have a working session uh, to uh, provide additional input onto um, specific issue papers that we are working on as a commission in advance of the upcoming budget deliberations at City Council. For our first official act of the afternoon, we will need a motion and a second to approve the July 25th, 2024 meeting minutes. Can I get a motion? Nick moves to approve the minutes. And a second. Pro seconds. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Is anybody choosing to abstain? With that, the uh, uh, meeting minutes from the last Planning Commission meeting pass unanimously. Um, in terms of our upcoming, uh, I'm now moving on to the chair's report. In terms of our upcoming commission meetings, our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, August 22nd from 7.30 to 9 a.m. That meeting, like this one, will be in a hybrid format with options for meeting in person in the boards and commissions room or using the MS Teams platform. And the August meeting of the Land Use and Transportation <coughs> Committee meeting has been canceled. Um, I think those that notice went out today, so please make note of that recent change. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Vanessa for announcements and commission business. Great. Thanks very much, Michaela. Um, so as Michaela noted, this is a hybrid format meeting. We have um, planning commission staff and staff from the uh, Office of Planning and Community Development and, to, and a commissioner and a soon-to-be commissioner joining us here in the boards and commissions room of City Hall, Seattle City Hall, I should note, and uh, the rest of the commissioners are joining the call via Teams. Um, for those who are joining the meeting via Teams, please put your name in the chat to be recognized to speak uh, when it comes time for um, commissioner comments, questions, and discussion. Um, please do not put substantive comments in the chat because we wanna make sure that anybody who may be calling in um, actually benefits from, from the full discussion of the commission. Um, I've not received any public comment to read uh, at the beginning or at the end of the meeting, so I will not be doing that. Um, I do want to update everybody that um, four uh, recommended appointees to the Planning Commission were introduced to the Land Use Committee yesterday uh, of Seattle City Council. Um, they are Zio Alvarez, Cecilia Black, Dylan Blasecki, and Dylan Stevenson. The committee approved and recommended approval uh, of those appointments, and those appointments will go before full city council on Tuesday. Um, and we'll be very excited to join uh, our new cohort of planning commissioners. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it back to Michaela 
to start the round of introductions. After introducing yourself, please call on a fellow commissioner to introduce themselves or ask um, myself for assistance identifying who hasn't been called on yet. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Michaela Daffern, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I work in affordable housing policy and planning and I live in Capitol Hill and I co-chair the planning commission with my new co-chair, Jamie Strobel, who I will pass it to next. Maybe Jamie has stepped away. I will pass it to Deanna next. Good afternoon. My name is Diana Quintanar. I use she, her pronouns. Um, for my day job, I'm a multimodal transportation planner. I live in Capitol Hill. Um, and I will pass it over to Jamie. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Jamie Strobel. I use she, her pronouns, and I am um, in the future 130th station area and I work in climate change and environmental justice. How about Monica? Yes, <clears throat> my name is Monica Sharma. I use she, her pronouns. I live in the central district um, and I work in organizing and advocacy around equity in youth sports and physical activity for King County Play Equity Coalition. And I will pass it to Nick. Good afternoon, Nick Whipple. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I live in West Seattle in the North Del Ridge neighborhood. And for my day job, I am a city planner. Uh, how about Rose? Hey all, Rose Lucella Whitson, pronouns they, them. I live up north in Licton Springs, and I work as a professional wetland scientist and permitting specialist with Jacobs Engineering for my day job. Uh, pass it to Lauren. Thanks, Rose. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Squire, Shiver. Um, I work at King County Metro, connecting the transit program lead, and I live in South Seattle. Zio. Hi y'all, Zio Alvarez, she they pronouns. I live in White Center Highland Park and I'm a designer and an architecture from downtown. Um, I can't see the full list of everybody on the meeting. So Vanessa, if you can help me out. Absolutely, Matt. Hey y'all, uh, it's Matt Malloy, he him pronouns, um, future get engaged uh, member and I work at the Queen Anne Beer Hall. And I'm not sure if that's too. We'll move on to staff. How about Olivia? Yeah, hi everyone. Olivia Baker. I use she her pronouns and I'm staff to the commission. John? Hi everyone. I'm John Hoy. I use he him pronouns. I'm staff to the planning commission. And I'll wrap this up. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vanessa Murdoch. I use she her pronouns. I too am staff to the commission and I will turn it back to Michaela. All right, thank you. Um, do we have anybody signed up to give public comment yet, Vanessa? We do not. All right. So we can move to our first, uh, our sub area planning agenda. All right. So I want to warmly welcome Erica Bush and Jesse London from the Office of Planning and Community Development. Thank you for joining. Um, they will provide us with an update on their respective sub area planning work. We were briefed on this work in November of last year, and we have an hour for this agenda item, needing to wrap up by around 4.15. Welcome, Erica and Jesse. I will pass it off to you. And Jesse, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Jesse London, yep. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for having us, everyone that's online, everyone that's in the room. I'm Erica Bush, as mentioned, I'm with the Office of Planning Community Development, um, as you previously met me when we came um, some time ago to talk to you all, uh, but we've kind of made some strides in our sub area planning work, so we're super excited to bring that to you all today. Um, we are going to speak quite briefly about each of the sub area plans that we're working on today, so I apologize for that, but we have a lot to cover, so um, 
we wanted to make sure that we touched on everything that we could. So I'm going to give a little brief introduction to the sub area planning process overall, start us off, and then um, I'm going to speak to some developments that have occurred in the downtown sub area plan and then pass it off to Jesse to speak to Northgate and um, Capitol Hill first. Up. And Jesse is going to share. That's true. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, so can you guys online? I'm hoping that what I see is what you see. Can you guys see our presentation? OK. Thumbs up. OK, cool. Yes. Every time I go to full screen, it exits me out of the. I feel like this is like a problem in this. You might just have to okay. get it smaller. Apologies. All good. So as mentioned, um, Jesse and I are the sub area planning team. Um, thank you for having us here today. Um, uh, we have been working on these plans since September, um, but they have been underway for significantly longer than that, just within OpenCD sort of getting a brief um, kind of like base understanding of what the department as a whole hopes to accomplish with these plans. So um, that's where we are. So just to root us in um, what sub area plans are, they are rooted in the comprehensive plan, which you all know very well. Um, the Seattle comprehensive plan, as you know, is a roadmap for where the city as a whole will go over the next 20 years. And then within the sub area plan, it establishes these regional growth centers, which were previously urban growth centers um, that will collectively encompass a large portion of the designated both um, job and housing growth over that next 20 years. And so for these specific regional areas, we do focused planning efforts to ensure that the vision that the community holds for these um, concentrated areas is reflective as that growth happens. So um, that end the difference, of course, from the comprehensive plan to the sub area planning or regional center growth areas is really that it is a focused geography. Each of this plan, each of these plans are focused on particular areas. And um, while they're grounded in the comprehensive plans, policies and approach, they get to a much more finite level of detail about um, elements that would respond to the needs, particularly of that community. So um, just to remind, um, everyone in the room who may or may not heard us the last time we came to speak with you. There's two phases of these sub area plans. We are in the first phase, which is tackling downtown Capitol Hill First Hill and Northgate, which um, will is underway and um, will wrap sometime depending on legislative process in 26 we're expecting. And then the phase two plans will begin on a rolling basis as those are adopted, which will include South Lake Union, Uptown, and the University District. There is discussion of whether um, there would also be a Ballard Regional Center, which has not been um, currently resourced, but is in conversation. Waiting for Jesse to correct me. Oh, it's in the draft comp plan. Um, and I, I assume that that would be adopted as part of the plan, but we are not funded to work on it. Okay. Right. Um, so uh, with that, I wanted to mention some topics that we are hearing across the uh, first phases <clears throat> of all of our plans. And so um, I would say that it's a, it, these are topics of conversation you'll hear over and over again, but um, our are just general concerns that multifamily housing size units are not being developed currently, and those that are um, are extremely cost prohibitive. So um, one of the these are also things we'll be trying to find solutions for, and would love to hear your feedback. Um, safety is on top of mind in all areas, particularly as it relates to downtown, but in a lot of our commercial areas, as we're seeing the change in commercial use, we're seeing lack of 
um, utilization and activation of our commercial areas, which is causing safety concern, in addition to the level of um, those in need that is growing within our city. We are also hearing loud and clear that people across um, Seattle, particularly in these areas, really want to see their fellow Seattleites cared for and have increased access for additional social services and basic amenities like restrooms, like access to clean water, um, like mental health services and substance abuse um, services in every regional center. Uh, there is a lack of meaningful um, retail support that addresses equity issues and keeps longtime tenants in place. We are seeing displacement not just in a residential capacity, but also in a retail capacity that um, retailers have historically provided a lot of social services in our communities. They've taken care of community, they've welcomed people into their space, they've been third places, and as increased pricing for those um, commercial spaces occur, we lose those tenants and we lose the general overarching services that they provide to their community. And then I would say that there's also concern about the maintenance and continued development of open space as we densify. So a key portion of a reason why the PSRC requires that we do these regional plans is to denote how we will absorb continued growth. And there's an imbalance between our focused growth and the number of open spaces coming online. It used to be that we were really sought to have an X number of open space acres for X number of residents with sort of a tenant for urban planning. And we've been told by the Parks Department that's just not physically possible anymore. We cannot produce the amount of parks and open space that um, we previously thought was a applicable and, and reasonable in our urban spaces. So we are needing to be more creative and think really uh, more deeply about how we're taking care of the existing open spaces that we have available for our residents. So um, this is a slide just talking about the process that we're currently undergoing, particularly for the downtown plan, um, but in some capacity in, in all three plans. There are key topic areas that the PSRC has required that we do and discuss within these documents. They range from environment and climate action to land use, housing, economy, transportation, and public services. And then through the process of that we've been undergoing for the previous few months, is doing a technical analysis of our existing conditions around those topic areas while also engaging with community on them and kind of molding together that technical information and what we're hearing from community, which is then guiding how we're structuring or looking to structure our plan moving forward. So um, as you can see, these um, actions such as you know, housing for all or sustainable systems of funding, spaces for art, they intermix across different elements of the PSRC um, requirements. So if you're, you're talking about housing, you might be talking about space for art while also talking about a sustainable system of funding, um, while also talking about, you know, creating recreational space for multiple uses and, and demographics. And so, um, we're looking to frame this plan not specifically in those PSRC topic areas, but instead looking to themes that are emerging from our community engagement and centering goals and policies beneath those. So we'll be able to point to how we are responding to the PSRC topic areas. But when we come back to you with an actual draft, we're sort of giving you a heads up that it won't be the housing chapter. It will be one of our themes and it'll talk to elements that are going to fit into a number of topic areas that are really more in response to um, areas that community is focused on. So I'm going to dive into downtown a little bit now. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we're going to be very brief. <laughs> so there's a lot more to chew on, um, but 
we thought we would just bring some um, sort of uh, critical elements that have come to the surface thus far in our work. So timelines wise, um, as mentioned, you know, we've really been listening and learning um, regarding uh, key stakeholders and uh, those identified through our racial equity toolkit since 2023, before Jesse and I even came on board and holding uh, stakeholder meetings with those identified within the RET analysis. Uh, we had our first uh, full-fledged public workshop in February of 24, um, and since then have really been working on assembling those technical reports. We are now starting to craft a vision. We've done an internal um, workshop and are um, having additional um, sort of key stakeholder conversations to test the themes and elements that have come out of engagement. And then we'll have a um, second workshop at the end of September, which we're happy to share with all of you, where we'll be um, both sharing back with the community our technical findings and phase one engagement, but also starting to elevate uh, that that draft vision and draft goals that will shape um, policies into the fall with um, plan, draft plan being um, circulated for annual departmental review later this fall and a public draft plan presented to the public in um, early 2020. So um, this is like a little snapshot of what's been done today. So as mentioned, there's been um, a process where we want to honor past conversations. So there was an extensive effort done to review what planning efforts have occurred in and around downtown for the past few years and were underway when this planning process started. So things like the Seattle Transportation Plan, um, you know, the, the CID action, um, frameworks, the, there's just, there's dozens of plans that have touched downtown. And so there was a lot of work just to kind of categorize and, and call through that information. Then um, we started with uh, some key ret focused conversations. Those included conversations with you, um, pop up at events. There were artist led documentation of certain festivals across downtown. And then there were some small scale um, focused conversation with arts organizations, um, with those that work in housing, um, in employment, and um, again, with uh, those who serve youth versus youth themselves. And um, as mentioned, then we had the public workshop at Hirabayashi Place and had some really focused um, district level conversations um, with stakeholders in Belltown and the CID who are facing some particular residential challenges just given the land uses in those areas. And then what's happening right now is we're having some follow-up key conversations with agencies such as um, Seattle Parks Foundation, the Port, um, uh, Seattle Center, Austin the Waterfront, uh, sort of those who have King County big sort of um, uh, footprints in downtown. And uh, yeah, and then we'll flow into the workshop and, and through final outreach, of course, and review of that draft. So some engagement outcomes to date. Um, I don't think a lot of these will come as a surprise to you all. But there's a large concern for safety amongst our downtown residents. Um, there's a desire to improve neighborhood quality of services that serve families. There's a need for the diversity of housing. Seattle has an incredibly sort of oversaturation of studio and one better needs and very few of anything of greater scale than that. And our data is reflecting that in addition to what people are um, telling us and, and saying it's a challenge. Uh, there's an ongoing conversation and challenge of seismic retrofits, particularly in the CID with the level of unreinforced masonry buildings that we have 
and wanting to retain the historic character of that neighborhood. We also need to have just more affordable housing across um, all sectors. But with those uh, in close proximity to resources, we can serve those living in that affordable housing. There's um, also a uh, feeling of a need for health and safety and transportation to downtown where the businesses. Businesses are really saying that those who work for them can't afford to live here, and that's a challenge. They can't um, they can't respond to the needs of their businesses um, without having that workforce housing available. Um, that there's a much too much red tape to opening and operating businesses in Seattle. That it's really a challenge, um, and that there is still a great desire to open new business in downtown, which. Um, and but that there's some real impediments to doing so. The TIs or tenant improvements are extremely expensive, and it's really um, challenging to go through those processes of um, permitting. Um, and there's also uh, differing variations of um, regulatory frameworks across our neighborhoods. Some of our preservation districts are in they're there for critical reasons, but they're causing additional challenges for those operating smaller, particularly smaller scale businesses in those districts that we need to find means of better supporting them through. Um, our foot traffic downtown um, is really diminished from pre-pandemic levels still today. We're only seeing a percentage, you know, of, we're not seeing pre-pandemic levels downtown yet. And that is a challenge for our retailers um, that we need to be more strategic about our priority corridor investments, that there's um, there's only so much energy kind of in downtown right now, and we should really focus on the areas where we want to sort of create hubs of hub energy. Then um, we spoke at length to our arts and cultural community, and there was also a significant um, process underway through the downtown activation plan through the mayor's office as well as the office of the waterfront who also created their own um, cultural plan and so we were able to kind of um, utilize that feedback as well that um, the city as a whole really needs a commitment to the arts we have to be much more vocal about um, how much we care for the arts and that it's something that is at the heart of the city. We need to dedicate more space to artists and affordable space to artists um, for all kinds, not just standard sort of like paint and fine arts, but we need performance spaces. We need for spaces where people can practice. We need music spaces. We need, like we have to think about the arts in a more holistic way and providing opportunities for access to spaces to accomplish that. Artists aren't fairly compensated for their work, um, and we don't really think holistically about the gig economy that surrounds the artist world. Um, you know, we we um, are focused, I think, in our affordable housing systems, for example, of meeting a certain percentage AMI and having paperwork that designates what AMI you are. But when you're a gig worker as an artist, demonstrating that capacity is very challenging when your income may be coming from 20, 30, 50 different places a year, it's very hard to legitimately sort of um, describe how much you're able to pay in your housing prices. Um, construction projects are long and disruptive for artists as well. It's really hard for them to show their work if people don't feel they can access galleries, particularly in Pioneer Square. And the construction that's been happening there. Um, and that we should be doing more to center racial equity and bring um, Black, Indigenous, and Brown artists back into downtown and to elevate the, their expression in our built environment. Real quickly, I know I'm probably eating up too much time. Uh, youth, we heard a lot about just needing space to be where they feel comfortable and they don't feel like they're being pushed along that they're unwanted. We have a lot of our spaces downtown are in a sort of pay to play environment where they're not free and they're not um, just openly. We have, um, 
I think it might be on our slides. We have absolutely no play fields or open recreational spaces downtown. We have four playgrounds. Um, we have very little space that are just flexible and accessible to youth. Um, and that uh, families overall need to feel that their children will be comfortable coming to downtown. We heard a lot from service providers for youth um, and from families that they there are a lot of programs and sort of cultural amenities downtown that they're uncomfortable with their kids accessing right now. They don't feel comfortable allowing them to take light rail or buses by themselves to go to the CID or Pioneer Square to participate in um, camps, in educational programming. And that's a really big impediment. Um, and then last of all, that downtown really has a lot of identities. If you talk to someone in Belltown versus someone in Pioneer Square versus the CID, they have a very different perception of what downtown is and what it means to them. Um, and making sure that we continue to be respectful of what is authentically downtown. So um, part of our racial equity uh, toolkit process is creating these draft outcomes. These are um, actually just a few of them, but we then take these outcomes and they inform um, our theme development. So for example, um, the housing draft threat right now is that downtown offers diverse housing options and support for people who are in their lives without creating cost burden. For arts and culture, it's a thriving creative community lives in, works in, and shapes the downtown experience. Um, so these are just sort of like the, the core threat um, elements that then feed into our future themes. So um, just some quick uh, key technical findings to date. Um, there are different definitions of downtown when you review certain documents. So our downtown um, boundaries reflect a smaller number of residents than you'll read in some other reports. Um, a lot of people speak to center city instead of downtown, which encompasses components of South Lake Union or First Hill, Capitol Hill. So sometimes a larger number is thrown around. So I just want to mention that since you're all planners that um, our boundary, which is you know, Denny um, down to the CID is just under uh, 50,000 residents. A interesting factoid about that is that while we're exceeding we're exceeding our growth targets, greater uh, Diana said, yes, so greater downtown, meaning that we also include the CID, which I think um, in some people's mind is often its own separate portion of the city. Um, so uh, downtown is on um, its on its current trajectory will be the largest um, urban center for residential population by 2044. It will outpace Capitol Hill and First Hill as a residential hub. Um, another interesting fact is that over 75% of our downtown housing units have been built since 2000. It's a very young residential um, land use. Our median uh, age of the housing we have downtown is 2011. So when we are talking about the services and the adjacent amenities that our residents need in downtown, a lot of it is um, because we haven't had a lot of time to build out a network that supports our residents in this portion of our city. It's been heavily um, zoned, heavily designed for as a commercial center, not as a, a residential center. And so we have a lot to do to really adapt this environment to meet that growing um, population. Yeah. So uh, just some interesting demographic information. This probably doesn't come as a surprise, but there is an extreme 
uh, difference across our downtown in regards to both its racial and social equity index and our median incomes. The northern portion of downtown is exceptionally different than the southern half of downtown. And you, I'm sure you cannot read the, um, the legends on either of these maps, but hopefully the colors will uh, sort of like get somewhat to what they're pointing to, um, which is that um, our, our northern portion is really almost at the lowest or second lowest end of um, the, the racial social equity need index, mm -hmm. while the southern portion of our downtown is at the highest. Mm -hmm. So those, we are, we are really trying to serve a very diverse group of people when we're talking about downtown. Um, the CID has um, our, our largest at-risk population for displacement. It has our greatest uh, air quality issues across the city of Seattle. It has some of our largest concentrated um, elderly populations. Um, and then you move to the northern end of downtown where we have some of our highest income earners um, in the city. So um, serving those populations within a walking distance of each other is, is pretty unique. Um, we also have public spaces that are uh, trying to accomplish a lot. We um, only have nine parks that offer water access and only three public restrooms in our public spaces. Oh yeah. <laughs> the new and all three. Three. Yeah. Just want to reemphasize wow. that. Oh, wow. um, and <laughs> despite uh, continued efforts, we are losing canopy coverage as our um, as our heat island effect continues to become more pronounced. Uh, Downtown's vacancies in public lands are a challenge, but an opportunity. We in downtown have, as you can kind of see in that chart, um, we have a really large a percentage of vacant um, parcels when you look across the, um, the different urban centers. We're only second to Northgate, which is very surprising given the kind of land use that we're seeing in, in a much more suburban environment to a highly concentrated urban environment. Um, we also have a very large percentage of publicly owned parcels in our southern downtown. And so while uh, that is creating quite a bit of the challenge of um, sort of a, an underutilized environment that we're seeing today, it's also a pretty big opportunity. We have a lot of land, a lot of space, and a lot of public amenity area or publicly owned area that we could be um, reorienting to serve our population much better. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Jess. Cool, thanks. Um, I'm going to call it a bit of an audible here and ask, should, would you prefer that we pause for questions for that piece and then go to the other one and then pause again, or, or would you rather we go forward? See if we have initial questions. Okay. And then, um, and, and because the, our second agenda item, I, I want to be mindful of your time, but we don't have a super hard stop at 415. So okay. if we go to 420, it's okay. As long as you both are available, I know you need to scoot out. So, um, Mikhail, I don't know if you want to ask uh, if there are questions from commissioners to pop them, pop their names in the chat. Please drop your name in the chat and I'll call on people. I think we're just <laughs> over. Yeah, I'm just absor I'm absorbing. It's like it's a lot of good information. And, you know, and then we're going to go talk about North Cape. Yeah. Like, I've been really like, in that context. So I was like, I need a, like, a little bit of a transition, but I don't want to totally blow up the time, you know. Uh, to be honest, question about I, I have seen the, the, the term greater downtown used in that desktop of work from last year, 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that did include South Lake Union uptown and both hills. Oh, wow. So it was that was big. But, but I mean, but it's obviously has a colloquial meaning as well. So, but yeah. 
but, but your, your point stands so from Denny to the yeah, I the freeway to water. We have no questions in the chat. So Lauren, do you want to go? Sure, thank you. Okay. Um, I am interested in kind of this stat that you were saying, Erica, around um, downtown being on pace to be our biggest residential center. Could you like just talk more about those projections and is it coming from uh, like zoning capacity or just because that's, and I really also appreciate what you said too of like, most of the residential presence in downtown has been since 2000 and it feels like a little bit validating to be like okay cool like we've only had you know a little less than 25 years to try to adapt and i'm i'm just thinking about how heavily weighted we are from a commercial and office and then thinking about south downtown as like a real kind of public and civic campus it was just really helpful for me to like have you say all of that, but then to be like, wow, we're we're on pace to just continue really ramping up the number of resident residents that live here, which is great, but kind of wondering where that comes from. Yeah, so a lot of it, some of it is designated within a comp plan. Like there, there's there is zoning capacity in downtown. I mm -hmm. mentioned that's like that's the key element of it. There's also sort of the political identification of trying to focus house like TOD uh -huh. or housing adjacent to our largest um, transit investments, which largely will occur in downtown. Um, and the fact that like if we want to see um, additional, I would say high density housing growth, this is a logical location for that. Yeah. Um, I think too, um, there's a like consistent notion that we are never going to see the same levels of, commercial, of like office space utilization that we previously did within our commercial centers. And there's been a consistent, like very local desire for us to re adapt our urban center to be more diverse in its use and residential use is sort of critical to the functionality of the center as mm -hmm. an economic hub. Mm -hmm. I have a, a follow-up point that I'd like to ask around that. So if we're funneling most of our residential growth into downtown over the next planning period, and we are going to achieve that mostly through high rise and pretty dense multifamily development. Um, what tools are at your disposal to make sure that we create income restricted housing while we take advantage of that building boom? I want to think of downtown as a place where people of all income levels have a choice to live downtown if they want. And I, I worry that if we don't have an intentional strategy to make sure that we protect, create, and then preserve the, some affordability along with that, um, that we will uh, not, downtown will not be a place where people with, uh, with lower incomes can live. So just curious what you're looking at as your strategies for, for that piece of the yeah. downtown plan. I mean, given our current like economics, it, it's it's probably more complicated than it's ever been um, because the cost to develop is so high. What I will say is back to the point about um, the degree of public ownership within our downtown. That's really where our greatest opportunity lies. How can we reallocate the government or public owned parcel publicly owned buildings to serve that population and be strategic about how we serve um, and create affordable housing because there isn't the funding to acquire land we have to, as a as a city uh, basically we're being told that we need to use existing publicly owned opportunities. So a lot of our focus will be on how how we better utilize what we already have. And then 
really thinking strategically about, I think that infill potential, there are some, there are new innovative building technologies that allow for um, higher density development on much smaller parcels. You know, CLT particularly, um, and changing our codes that um, diminish the need for side setbacks or other challenging um, means of not being able to utilize every available. So, and kind of looking at how we should be like having a consistency of building frontages without these, these like sort of vacancies or unutilized um, areas that collectively add up to be a lot and could be housing a lot of people. And how to re resource our um, partnerships and affordable housing to do so, which is what Jesse and I need to figure out how to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I'm not seeing any other questions or any other names in the chat box. I think we are good to move on to the Northgate presentation. Cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, so this uh, is, a, is a rather artsy outline of the uh, Northgate Regional Center uh, boundary. Uh, it's, uh, if you'll recall, centered around the, the former mall site. It includes the light rail station sort of to the south there. I-5 goes right down the middle of it, and then there's a a kind of awkward uh, stretch up to the northwest to bring in the like the job density from the uh, northwest uh, medical center at, at UW. So that's just some context setting uh, there. And and then the reason it does that little reach is because we need we you need certain um, density of jobs and housing in order to qualify for the PSRC designation, which we want to do. Um, so the schedule is fairly similar to that of downtown. It started uh, in earnest around the same time. So we're also uh, through one phase of engagement, uh, most of the way through our, our technical research. Um, we have a, a few more uh, outreach uh, kinds of events, although we won't have the same number of like fully public workshops. I don't I think we'll have one less, but um, uh, as, as with all the other plans, there will be a little bit of a transportation specific outreach after the levy. Um, we'll have a, a little touch base with our groups that we talked to in the first round uh, with our vision and, and um, higher high, high level goals. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll revisit who those folks were in another slide. Um, and then similarly, we'll have it's a downtown. We'll have a release of the public draft um, early next year. Uh, will be the first time you all see a completed version of that draft and can um, provide more uh, substantial uh, comment. Um, so uh, yeah, the first round of engagements um, that that ran, you know, end of last year, early this year, um, it was uh, pretty heavily driven by our uh, racial equity toolkit outcomes. Um, we worked really hard to uh, identify previously underserved uh, communities and or uh, organizations that represent said communities in this uh, in this area. Um, Rather, and I'm not comprehensive list, but but um, some of our uh, uh, I'd say like the majority of the groups that we talked to are, are listed here. Um, that included a, a, f a number of uh, uh, in language focus groups um, uh, as 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 necessary, uh, and, and um, focused on uh, a lot more uh, people who work in the uh, service sectors um, throughout, throughout the community that. I think um, have a, we have a harder time reaching and planning processes uh, traditionally. Um, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we'll reach back up to them a, a, little, a little bit lighter touch, but uh, just to make sure we're on the right path uh, with uh, our, our vision statements and all that uh, in the next couple of months. Um, yeah, and so outcomes from that uh, first phase of engagement. Um, Folks are are pretty uh, excited about uh, Thornton Creek and Beaver Pond and, and the, the the beavers therein. Um, they uh, uh, really are craving the uh, the a replacement for the sort of gathering and leisure space that the mall used to provide, and now kind of leaves a, a almost literal hole in that set of needs. Um, uh, 
walkability, as you might imagine, generally quite 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 poor. I'll, I'll, there's some more technical uh, observation of that in, in another slide, but um, yeah, that's uh, uh, giant blocks, uh, poor sidewalk connectivity. Uh, you know, it was uh, um, one of the one of the first uh, post-war when mall developed uh, sites uh, that are very car oriented. So it's, it's just um, uh, and, and it, 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 it's made it it's made it quite difficult to capitalize fully on some of its better uh, uh, public assets like the light rail station and, and or open spaces and things like that. It's, you, you have to drive to get there or, or you have to walk dangerously uh, to get there. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think big picture folks are, are ready to see what is next. The, um, uh, I, I mentioned that there's a lot of uh, redevelopment going on at the, at the mall site. Um, a lot of that has, has slowed uh, pretty substantially over the last year uh, to a lot of the same supply side cost issues that uh, Erica um, uh, alluded to earlier uh, in, the, in the broader development community. Uh, so I, people want to find out what that next new, what that new identity is going to be, what it's, what it's going to look like physically, um, functionally, um, and, and, uh, and they, hope, they hope that that includes um, some of that same assets that people are desiring uh, throughout the city, you know, more affordable housing, uh, more diverse housing stock, um, uh, more uh, transportation options, uh, and the like. Um, yeah, that was, as I said before, driven by our racial equity toolkit outcomes. These are um, pretty iterative. We've changed them a couple times based on what we've heard. They'll probably be tweaked a little bit again. Um, I, I really like these. This this set of uh, of, of red outcomes um, because they're pretty explicit about impacts on uh, uh, BIPOC communities and and uh, and develop uh, as uh, specifically as these practical uh, metrics that we can use to track success uh, over the lifetime of the plans. Um, so that's something that uh, we look forward to do during implementation uh, here in the years uh, down the line. Um, moving on to the, our technical analyses, uh, I, I mentioned the, the super blocks. Um, there's an interesting depiction of that here. Uh, most of the blocks, the vast majority of the blocks are, are, are three times or, or more uh, the size of, a, of an ideal uh, urban, uh, urban block. Um, you can kind of see hints of, uh, of a more urban grid in certain parts of the neighborhood, but it's, it's uh, uh, really, even if you're just, even if you're driving, you know, walking, driving, biking, whatever, you, you have to go around a, a lot of, uh, a lot of big blocks in order to get where uh, you need to go. And that's obviously not ideal for uh, efficient uh, transportation system. Um, and not to mention, um, uh, we work pretty closely with, with S on these projects and, and it's something that they identified uh, through an expansion of some of their work through the Seattle transportation plan is uh, an inventory of, uh, Missing pieces of transportation infrastructure, particularly uh, sidewalks or or poor uh, or substandard sidewalks, in addition to those that are just not not there, um, and uh, identified a, a tier, a priority tier system um, for uh, uh, replacing them in the capital improvement plans in in, uh, in future years. Uh, and we'll be, um, as I said, SDOT will be doing a uh, some outreach after the levy to try to further prioritize those or more specific about uh, design and implementation or things like that. Uh, and then of course, all of the pavement means um, has, has a number of uh, environmental implications. Um, yeah, heat island effect uh, pretty strong in certain parts around the neighborhood, not, not uh, surprisingly in and around I-5 um, and uh, plenty of uh, localized uh, flooding risk in the long term well, and, and in the near term really that the underpass uh, gets uh, flooded things near the Thornton uh, Creek daylighting. Uh, that's that those will uh, often uh, back up as, as well during certain times of year or, uh, or during heavier uh, rain seasons. Um, talked about pace of redevelopment slowing. That's about 1,700 uh, residential units currently in the pipeline. Um, not as many as we probably would have expected a year ago, um, but you know, plenty of. Uh, uh, I think another half dozen at least projects on, on the former mall site that are entitled but not yet fully permitted or having broken ground. Um, although there were a few um, marquee projects that you may have heard had broken ground a couple of weeks ago now. Um, 
that pipeline is exclusively rental housing. Again, not a huge surprise. The the uh, uh, what's it called the construction defect liability insurance like makes building condos like exceptionally expensive these days. That's like a, been a problem really throughout the country and particularly on the West Coast. Uh, so it's, it's we're um, you know been diving into some performa analyses of uh, building housing that is intended to be owned in these urban contexts, and that's proven to be like extremely difficult to make pencil out. Uh, so uh, uh, something uh, worrisome that we need to try to uh, figure out uh, policy approaches to uh, alleviate, in the, at least in the short term. Um, these projects include a couple of significant affordable housing projects. There's the Seattle Housing Authority redevelopment of the Northgate Commons, uh, just north of the mall site, as well as the bridge housing project. That's a couple hundred units on the where the park and ride sits uh, now at the northern half of that. Um, and notably, the, the newer market rate units are expected to increase average rents. And I think our economists have some uh, pretty serious concerns that those are going to be units that existing residents are going to struggle to afford. So I, I, I think that creating that diverse housing stock and, and uh, continuing to emphasize uh, and create opportunities for um, housing and housing authority to uh, invest in affordable projects here is going to continue to be critical. Um, more on the economic development side, pretty healthy jobs to residents ratio. Um, so plenty of opportunity to work, but I, the, the, the labor pool is uh, at least relative to the rest of Seattle, pretty relatively low uh, educational attainment and, and, uh, and training. So uh, a couple of options there policy wise. I mean, you, you could either sort of say like, hey, we know that the, um, that the food services and, and, and things like that are going to be replaced as the mall site redevelops. And that's going to be a, a decent match for, for, uh, for the less skilled labor pool. Um, or, or you could say like, hey, there's also a couple of industries that are succeeding, such as healthcare uh, in the immediate area and um, an opportunity to, to match uh, some of the less trained workforce with uh, educational services, like at the, the college, which is just outside of the boundary of the southwest there, um, uh, to, to be able to uh, prepare them to, to work in that. Just can I ask a clarification? Yep. So you're saying I see that incomes are far below the city in the region of Northgate, yep. and then you're saying that there's lower educational attainment. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that there's a mismatch between the density of jobs and the level of jobs at Northgate and the people that live in proximity? Uh, not necessarily. I, I, I think that it, it could be it, it could be a good match if uh, if we grow in the right areas. So I, so I guess what I'm saying is like we're expecting retail to come back to this area, maybe not in the same volume or same exact types as it was before the site decided to redevelop, but they are expected to be a similar class of jobs that the people who live here now would qualify for. Um, yeah, I could, currently, I want to say it's like one in four people who live there also work there. It used to be higher than that. And we, we are assuming that is related to the what the mall jobs provided. So that's 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 one pathway to making sure that these people have jobs nearby that match their skill set. But I'm I'm also like pointing to this opportunity to um, enhance their skills and give them higher paying jobs as well. So that's into Seattle before I live there, which has that the standard. Yeah. Uh what more? Nope, that's it. So yeah, I'll pause here for questions. Um, I am feeling a little overwhelmed by all of the content. <laughs> yeah, that was fast. Oh, was it? I, yeah, uh, I mean, I this just feels in. So I was kind of like feeling that. It's okay. Yeah, go ahead. It, this feels like really important planning information, and I, I'm not, I'm feeling a little like, I have so much to say. There's so many questions mm -hmm. that I'm sure others on the call feel the same way. So um, I think uh, let's just use this for a little bit of like uh, clarifying questions. We'll move on to the next piece, but I do just want to acknowledge that I feel like I feel like you're presenting some really important information that we'd like to weigh in on. 
um, and we might need to look to Vanessa to figure out how to um, uh, how to how to manage that in the time that we have for today. Um, I am looking at the queue here. Does anybody for clarifying questions? I see. Uh, I see Lauren, and, but she is asking if other people want to say something first. Um, Diana, do you have a? Do you want to go? I guess um, to uh, thanks for that, Michaela. I think um, I uh, share the sentiment that both presentations, the Silveri plan and this Northgate um, information, is incredibly helpful, super valuable commend you uh, and, and thank you for providing us a succinct of presentation as you've been able to uh, share with us here for today's purposes. Uh, but probably a similar sentiment, Michaela, that um, there's so much I probably was still trying to wrap my head around even for the previous presenters and I'm just being able to um, uh, synthesize what I wanted to mention. So I don't know if right now is the appropriate time for me to comment a couple of quick thoughts on the previous presentation or if we should focus on uh, Northgate first and I'll wait until we finish kind of the Northgate comments and come back to those. Let's do that. Let's see if um, uh, we're, we're losing Zio. Bye Zio. Um, I think folks are feeling an, an interest in absorbing the information before they respond. Um, Rose does not have any questions. She's still absorbing. It's a lot of information. Nick has a question. I'm also still absorbing. This is a lot of great information. Um, it seems like with all of the urban centers, except for ballot, of course, if that's adopted in the final plan, um, they either intersect or abut I-5 or 99. I'm curious in some of that early outreach, uh, what, what strategies you all are thinking about in terms of air quality or noise impacts, especially as um, you're looking to increase kind of uh, the families that would live in these areas, and those are uh, really important considerations, I think. Um, so I didn't see that, at least in the downtown discussion, but I saw, I think, you, when you flashed up the slide on the racial equity tool outcome examples, it did seem to have at least something in Northgate speaking to some of the noise and air pollution there. So curious if you could speak more to that. Michaela, if that's not a clarifying question, which I understand it's not, uh, you can also just say let's let's address that offline. You already asked it. Let's go ahead and give them an, an opportunity to respond. Sure. I'm curious okay. about the answer as well. Uh, well, not coincidentally, all three of these areas have uh, within them some significant tree canopy issues. Uh, along with some of their uh, uh, overly paved spaces. Um, I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit in the first show presentation, but uh, I think that uh, that is for I mean, environmentally, that's kind of a, a big deal and something we'll have to emphasize. I know that OSC has a tree equity plan that we are yet to tie into. Um, and I, I, we also have uh, a little bit more work to do with like the public space team that works with SDOT uh, in their uh, Street tree program, uh, so I, I think that's that's one pathway we're working towards, but having like just the, as much time as we would have liked to this point. Mm -hmm. I'd also say that we like are just starting to think about if there are mechanisms um, for building code um, that would be responsive to like increased, uh, basically like HVAC systems, soundproofing, like having some more um, focused attention on those areas immediately adjacent to I-5 because in certain areas they are possibly going to see significantly more density. So what we can we do within our built environment to change that without you know, knowing that we probably can't put up giant sound walls across the extent of the roadway systems um, that bifurcate these areas and then Look in downtown. You know, there's there's a lot of interest in exploring the future of the lit I five project, and that has its own challenges. But we are actually hearing a lot more interest than we suspected in um, looking to litting opportunities to support additional green space and to 
try to reduce some of the impacts of I-5 in our densest areas. Nick, do you want to follow up with your clarifying question? Yeah, it's just on the timeline related to some of the uh, maybe projects or some of the actual code implementation work. The timeline showed craft plan and policies. Um, does that also include any corresponding map amendments or zoning changes that would need to be um, made in order to actually enact some of that vision that's established through the sub area planning? Or what's the timeline for those changes? Yeah, good question. Uh, so. We are not really resources. Eric and I are two people working on six plans. Hey, we're, we're not really like a uh, resource to like simultaneously be bringing zoning packages to council. We do have like a full long range planning team that will, that will be responsible for that as we start to adopt these uh, plans and addend them to the comp plan in 26. So, so that uh, we don't have like specifics on that, that, I guess that'd have to be something we have to talk to like Jeff Lemon about, like when when they imagine um, having the time to do that. But um, yeah, so generally speaking, the the assumption is that once the plans are adopted, a portion of our office will roll into the implementation and uh, the zoning actions and and code changes in accordance with that, while we then move on to the next three plans. If that makes sense. So phase two would happen while implementation of elements of phase one are implemented. So we would hope 27. Yeah, I mean, in the <laughs> world, it would, it would, they could prepare, they could, they could yeah. prepare to do it while we were having that. Ready to go. But I, I can't, I don't want to speak for another division. Mm -hmm. All right, Jamie. Uh, I just had a clarifying question of um, the Northwest Hospital was included because of the job center. And I'm kind of curious why North Seattle College isn't included for a similar reason or kind of what was the thought process behind that boundary? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, these were drawn in the 90s, so I can't necessarily flash back to like the mentality of those people who did that. But like uh, the the institute, like the big institutional uh, footprints, um, they're like I think sometimes they're seen as like if you, you have like a little bit, if there's like a major institutional overlay there, there's a there's a little bit less flexibility in terms of like what we can. Uh, do on a, on a more micro scale uh, for, on a future land use map, for example. Uh, they also have like fewer uh, public streets to cut through them, so maybe there was like less of an opportunity they saw to to channel the federal transportation dollars to the to those sites. But 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 that being said, you're not the first person who's brought that up. I I, I think that um, someone from the mayor's office like reminded us recently that that, that there were comp plan comments that had the same. Uh, question. So that's uh, yeah, and that's something we can consider. Oh, I, th I think that we can't do it until the we wouldn't be able to do it unless we amended the comp plan EIS, which uses certain regional center boundaries. So that it would it, we could do it. It would take time. We wouldn't do it as part of this process, but it, it is uh, absolutely something that if sufficient like interest and resources could could happen. I, I know that like, for example, the uptown boundary is probably going to be tweaked depending on the location of the of the, the final location of the light rail station, for example. So it, it, it can be on the table. Yeah, I'm just thinking about like the connectivity too of like the pedestrian bridge is connecting through North Seattle College and like um, and how can we think about that region as a whole, considering that um, not just jobs, but commuters and folks mm -hmm. who live in the area. Yeah, just how can we have a holistic approach to the region? And the colleges are typically also have a major institution master plan that underlies their kind of 
use, but I think that pedestrian bridge is a game changer for the way people move around Northgate um, and the way people think of uh, employment centers. Um, and so if you're not in communication with the colleges, strongly encourage that. Um, yeah, they were part of our of our of our okay. outreach. But yeah, we did, we did, we don't we didn't we weren't that strict about the boundary when it came to outreach. It's just okay. like when we're communicating like who qualifies for what types of investments. And that that's really when we bring it out. But like, yeah, it's not not really meant for that. Um, I, I do want to do a time check. We haven't heard from Diana. Um, I have some more questions on Northgate. We haven't heard from you about First Hill Capitol Hill. Um, what is your availability to go longer than 4.15? Um, we could also explore you coming back at a later time for us to have a follow-up conversation. I, I could go beyond 4.15. I understand that. Are you sure, Erica? Yeah. Okay. yeah, I Yeah, as long as I'm like out the door at 4.30. Okay. <laughs> okay. Does that give you spot. guys enough time <laughs> for more time? Do, do you yeah. want to continue to allow commissioners to ask questions and engage in discussion, or do you guys want to get on to Capitol Hill? Uh, first Hill. I sorry. prefer we cover First Hill and Capitol Hill. If Eric could just 15 more minutes. Okay. I could also do that. Yeah. Well, why don't you guys move on to presenting through through the final the next one and then we can pick up discussion as time permits afterwards thank you okay uh first hill capitol hill regional center uh similar to downtown in the sense that it has like a, you know, i mean the name even implies that there are several sort of sub neighborhoods when here within within this sub area that have uh, pretty dramatically different uh, sets of conditions um uh yeah, Capitol Hill, First Hill, the Pipeline Corridor, even even like 15th Avenue and uh, other uh, corridors that are so um, popular and have their own identities. Um, just to set some that geographic context there. Uh, the, this plan's schedule is a little a, a bit behind the other two. Um, uh, we don't expect a draft plan until closer to the summer. Um, we are basically in the middle, middle and middle of our, of our uh, first round of community engagement still. Uh, we won't have our first public workshop until the middle of next month, that is tentatively September 12th, but um, we have a couple people who need to uh, buy into that still before that's official. So uh, we'll, we'll be in touch with, um, we'll be communicating when that, that is finalized. Um, uh, yeah, we don't get our technical research analysis and our, 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 our first drafts and reports until tomorrow. So I'll have a little bit less to say about that in this uh, section of the presentation. Um, similar to the other plans, SDOT has a post levy uh, outreach period where they'll dig into stuff that's sort of uh, above and beyond the STP and the capital projects that they listed there. Um, yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that. Um, so, so the, the, my engagement report is, is a little bit more forward looking um, than some of the other plans, but uh, we are uh, working with the uh, Capitol Hill Eco District and Seattle Metropolitan Urban League uh, to uh, using uh, an existing community organization that is, uh, has a lot of well established uh, connections throughout the neighborhood and uh, uh, has been ex incredibly helpful in uh, setting up our Focus groups, uh, they conducted a, a tour on their own. We have a, a, couple, a public workshop coming up, um, uh, pop up events, and, uh, and we'll have, we have a public survey that is launched, although rather recently. And you'll see that in like the Capitol Hill blog and things like that shortly, I'm, I'm sure. Um, let's see, uh, I talked about the workshop, uh, the focus groups. Um, uh, we're focused on transportation, housing. Arts and culture and the environment. Um, we'll have a few more one on one interviews, as particularly when we get into like doing our financial analyses for the uh, economics report and looking into like potential um, uh, real estate development uh, trends. Um, What's that? Yes, the survey. The survey is active. Yeah. 
Um, we share it. We can. <laughs> Yeah, I can I can share it after. I know I I, sh I probably should have just linked it here. But uh, anyways, um, so we uh yeah reached a similar um, volume of groups that we uh, identified in the Northgate plan and had it also had a uh, similar approach in that it was they were the groups that we uh, reached out to and the organizations that we focused on were driven by the 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 red outcomes. Um. Let's see. Uh, looking at uh, feedback so far, um, obviously, like the, the transit and, and walkability, uh, particularly in the in the Capitol Hill portion of the sub area, is is quite strong, and people approve of uh, 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 to uh, quite quite positively. Um, um, first, the first hill, like major uh, arterials, so the Warren and Madison and parts of Twelfth, the uh, uh, much less comfortable. Um, for pedestrian spikes, uh, worse green space, worse tree canopy, uh, uh, you know, still pretty dense. And um, with the G line opening about a month from now, that's kind of a, a game changer for that part of the neighborhood. Um, uh, although uh, plenty of uh, complaints about the length of time the construction uh, took uh, over the past couple of years uh, that we've heard from the community. Um, Streetcar, pretty divisive. I'd say, like, pretty, pretty down the middle. There are people who, who find it useful, and there are people who find it to be like uh, uh, completely useless and like uh, way too slow, or, or just needs to be better integrated with the rest of the system. Um, I.e., in most cases, uh, connected to the, uh, to the South Lake Human Streetcar. Um, uh, it sounds like they are exploring a uh, business improvement area or perhaps expanding one of the existing ones uh, in Capitol Hill. And um, uh, oh, I know, we know that the Office of Economic Development is kind of walking them through that process and along with a number of other community groups uh, throughout the city. Uh, so uh, I, th I think that that's primarily for clean and safe type services. So that, you know, um, keeping the garbage off the streets and then providing a on the street pedestrian presence that kind of enhances uh, safety through um, through a clean and safe uh, team of, you know, a dozen or more uh, members, depending on the scale of the people who are interested in you know, businesses and populators that are interested in establishing that kind of entity. Um, uh, pretty overwhelming compassion for uh, the unhoused um, uh, and uh, a lot of advocates for uh, services that support those uh, those residents. Um, Public restrooms came up a lot here as well. Um, let's see, I think that covers my public outreach results. Um, all the red outcomes, uh, similar to downtown's uh, organization, although without as much of a of a arts um, uh, driven uh, piece here. Although although we did have an arts uh, focus group that uh, uh, definitely. Uh, was an impactful conversation for, for us in our policy discussions. Um, okay, so like I said, we don't get our technical reports till tomorrow, so I'll, I can go over like a few things here that we've heard in, uh, in, the, in our uh, research conversations before. Um, I want to mention one more yep, engagement please. item, which is that we heard um, a lot of focus on commercial displacement concerns in Capitol Hill as well. Sure, yeah. Retaining small scale local owned businesses. Yeah, and I can dovetail off that with some technical findings a little bit. Um, I think that our, our economists sort of look at the 5%-ish retail vacancy rate, and I think initially think like that's not that bad for uh, retail performance at that scale, uh, however, uh, when you think about where those vacancies are, a lot of them are in pretty prime locations, the pipeline corridor. And, if, and re recall that, um, as I'm sure you're all well aware, that uh, the uh, vacancy rate from this same sub area was less than 1%, you know, five, six, seven years ago. Uh, it, it's, it's, it is a pretty staggering uh, uh, change in spite of its like relative strong performance to maybe some of the other neighborhoods uh, in, the, in the city. Um, so uh, as many of you probably know, one of the densest residential neighborhoods on the on the West Coast, uh, high concentrations of high rise and mid rise zoning and 
um, also uh, uh, housing uh, being al allowed in most of the commercial corridors uh, in the red and orange here uh, as well. Um, a little bit of discussion about, uh, or well, I should say requests from property owners for pretty modest height increases along Olive Way, um, uh, particularly around like Olive and like Bellevue-ish, where the, where the old Starbucks is and some of those uh, underutilized or straight up abandoned like properties uh, along that part of the corridor. Uh, kind of an interesting discussion. Of, they're, I think they're really only looking to go to like 115 feet, which is kind of an awkward height for our uh, standards, but um, I mean, kind of interesting. Um, housing stock pretty pretty uh, old in certain parts of the neighborhood, particularly the, the northeast. Uh, I think that some people look at that uh, and and think like that's that's risk of uh, turnover or redevelopment of those properties just because of the improvement to land value ratio um, uh, being relatively low compared to the rest of the neighborhood. Um, staggering residential growth um, in terms of. I guess I was just looking at the residential population growth for the past 15 years. Um, that's, I think, the neighborhood has grown at 56% uh, uh, in terms of population over the, that period of time, whereas the city is only half of that. Uh, so that's um, uh, something that people are definitely uh, feeling and, and wondering about um, density, uh, how, how density uh, can be allocated to, to other parts of the city uh, in certain uh, communities. Um, very skilled workforce relative to uh, you know, the opposite situation in Northgate. Um, I'm not sure I've seen a neighborhood at this, observed a neighborhood at this scale that has a three quarters with a bachelor's degree or higher um, in my neighborhood planning history. So uh, I, I uh, that was uh, pretty interesting. I, I think many of them work at the Healthcare, I, I, we can't really uh, confirm this uh, with the data that we have access to, but it's it's likely that many of them work on the healthcare campuses here in the neighborhood, and if we tend to work more in like the service sectors, those people are uh, living farther and farther away, according to our community study. Uh, uh, some as far away as like the, the islands, just to find something that's affordable uh, based with that, with those uh, salaries uh, and incomes uh, in those industries. And there was the um, statistic that 75% of the jobs that are located within Capitol Hill are within the healthcare industry. Um, yeah, and primary transportation needs that we heard access to downtown, crossing that freeway, very tricky, certain parts of the neighborhood. Uh, plenty of sidewalk repair and in some, some pieces, sidewalk widening needs that SCP uh, identified. Um, Talked about the first hill arterials uh, not being the most uh, pleasant places on earth. Um, and a, a little bit of a, a vulnerability to, uh, uh, I guess, I guess the, the vulnerability to climate changes that we have observed are mostly economic in nature. And that's, and that is to say, like people who work in certain services, particularly like in a hot kitchen or have a look more physically demanding jobs as temperatures increase, uh, that those jobs become less tenable, comfortable, uh, more, you know, more to become more difficult to hold. Um, uh, and then I talked about the tree canopy. There's a, there's a little map here on the left uh, that illustrates the tree canopy loss issue, um, which is particularly strong in the, you see all the pink in the southeast in the first hill uh, area. Um, some of that is just like the tree failure being higher, and some of it is just redevelopment. Um, that's kind of an anecdotal observation. I don't have like the data on that, but uh, that's that's what uh, we've heard. Um, and uh, seismic vulnerabilities. That that's kind of what the that middle map is meant to illustrate. Uh, a lot of unreinforced masonry, particularly that Pike Pine corridor, um, uh, and uh, yeah, vulnerable to, to earthquakes. Uh, that. Is it, how did I do? It's four twenty-nine. Cool. <laughs> Very fast. So sorry. Um, I know you probably have a lot of questions. We can come back if you want, or we can like, you know, we have like reports that are like about our engagement, and you'll see our technical reports, you know, when the when we, the plans are closer to coming out uh, in more detail. But um, yeah. Could you drop the survey in the chat? Sure.
Do you guys have an ask of the planning commission? Like what's, what do you need from us? What do you, what were you hoping to get from us today? I would say a big element that we're seeing is, um, is pretty the North Gate is the displacement challenges. Like we see some yeah. of the highest displacement risk across the city in North Gate. <laughs> and so if there are um, displacement um, policies or approaches that you all have seen in your work or studied, uh, we'd be really curious about those. Um, that's one element. Um, I know that there's also been a concern of the lack of access to the health services that exist in Capitol Hill for those that actually live in Capitol Hill. And if, um, if in that regard, there's also been any kind of research or understanding that you've seen of how we bridge access to amenities sort of behind the gated walls of our health industry. Um, and then I would say uh, any knowledge uh, as it pertains to funding additional greenery in our rights of way, or work with SU wow. or um, the parks, how we how we infuse greenery into um, these urban areas that lack dedicated open space. Those are the top of mind. Uh, yeah, for, for me, the support for the more uh, equity and anti-displacement components of the um, Yeah, I, I think after, particularly after the comp plan, I, 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 just, I just want to like, I want the support for that to like be, to live throughout the lifetime of our and yeah, and beyond, beyond through its adoption. So uh, that's um, something I think about a lot, and I think that the planning commission is well suited to support. Okay, Vanessa. Yeah, I just um, I want to thank our presenters and thank you for going 15 minutes over time. I really yeah. appreciate that. Mm -hmm. My suggestion is that um, when available, if we could have the slide deck that yeah, you right. spoke to. Um, I will send that out to the commission and then I'll work with you both to figure out a time probably before the draft comes out um, just to, to, to have a, a follow-up conversation. And I think with the commissioners able to review the materials in advance, mm -hmm. we could um, make better use of the time. Of yeah, your time of, course. As well. of course, we really appreciate your guys' thoughts. Thank you for sharing. Of course. Thank you. It also sort of feels well suited for maybe some of our committee time, Vanessa, if we yeah. wanted to digest and talk through it. Um, Vanessa, just as we move into this new Teams format, are these meetings being recorded? Yes, these meetings um, are being recorded and will be posted to the Planning Commission YouTube channel. I'm looking at Olivia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and linked off of our website. Okay, I didn't Just, even know we had a YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Olivia, we do. Um, and then just for the commissioners on the call, um, if uh, after this meeting, if you could let me know how the interface to using Teams as opposed to Teams Live is working out for you. I know of one commissioner who's actually having more problems than with the Teams Live, so um, that would be helpful for us to know so we can troubleshoot. Okay. Um, Sorry, folks. I, I know I know Deanna and others had some comments and questions, and I think we will just pick those back up at a, at a later meeting. Um, for those who serve on the um, Housing and Neighborhoods Committee with me, um, you know that we have been working on some uh, material um, over the past few weeks. I think we're calling them papers of some sort. Um, and the, today, the intent is to bring all of the commissioners up to speed on the intent of these documents and to chart a path forward for the development of these pieces over the next five or six weeks. Um, and we have an hour for this working session, and I think John is going to start us off. I am. Okay. Um, 
Great. You were on vacation when we talked about this, which is why I thought maybe there was a mistypo in the document, but gl glad to hear from you. I came back and got right to work on it. Um, okay, so I just have a few slides. Um, we're going to talk about the budget process overview first before Olivia gets into the housing part of this discussion. Um, so I'm, I've been working on just a short overview paper to help commissioners understand the city's budget process and how the city develops its budget annually. That, pro that process is actually starting um, very soon. The city has city council has a select budget committee and they just announced at their meeting yesterday uh, their process for this year. So I will, I can actually send that presentation around after this meeting, but um, I've been preparing just a short paper to summarize the process. And I have a few slides just to share the highlights with you. So um, next slide, please. So just a few key bullet points for everyone to understand. The city of Seattle uses a biennial budget process. So um, the, it's updated every year, but it's kind of on a two year cycle. So the every other year is is an update to the adopted budget. Um, the city council exclusively focuses on creating a budget for two months every year and that will start in late September and go through late November. Um, that process starts when the mayor transmits a proposed budget to the city council in mid to late September. So that will happen in about a month from now. And then the council from there, their job as defined by the city charter is to consider the mayor's proposed budget, listen to members of the public, and there are many opportunities for public engagement, elevate issues and propose changes that are deliberated by the entire council after robust community stakeholder engagement. Um, so it's, it's a very long and robust process. Next slide, please. Um, just there, they have summarized the process as a five-step process. Um, step one, as I described, is when the mayor delivers the proposed budget. Um, CBO stands for Central Budget Office, um, just for your information. And the council deliberations begin at that point. Uh, step two is, is a series of budget hearings where CBO and the, and the various departments present their, um, their budget. Uh, central staff will present policy issues around all of the, the budget issues. Um, and then there, there is a uh, revenue forecast update that informs development of the budget. Step three is um, when the, the chair of the budget committee will present what's called a balancing package, and that is taking into consideration um, council member amendments, and uh, it's basically the council's version of the budget. And then step four, they, uh, after considering all the balancing package and the amendments, they will vote. And then step five is the final council action. And I have uh, some dates in the process for each of these for you all just to keep in mind. And we encourage you to follow this process as much as you want to. That all the budget meetings are um, they're public, they're they're online, they're Seattle channel. You can come to City Hall um, and pay attention throughout the process. Next slide, please. So uh, for this year, the proposed 2025 to 2026 budget is scheduled to be delivered from the mayor's office to the city council on Tuesday, September 24th. The select budget committee will start their deliberations the next day on September 25th. The, there will be a series of department presentations on, on their, those individual budgets uh, at the end of September through the beginning of October. The city council central staff will get will present its own uh, policy considerations for the budget in mid October, and then, as I mentioned before, they get the economic and revenue forecast update 
uh, October 22nd. So that will um, be considered in the in the council's deliberations. Next slide. And then the, the back half of the, the process. Go back one more, please. Um, the, the, the second half of the process is like I said, the, the chair's balancing package will come out at the end of October. Uh, individual council members will propose amendments and those are due on November 1st. And uh, those are incorporated into, um, those are actually discussed and voted on. And um, when they're talking about the balancing package, on uh, November 14th and 15th, then the committee will take any final votes on the budget legislation and those technical amendments November 19th, and it will all be wrapped up when City Council takes its final action on the proposed budget and all the associated legislation on November 21st. So it's a two month, September, October, November process, uh, pretty lengthy, pretty robust. Um, my last slide is just the various ways that the public can get involved in the budget process. There are three ways. Um, the first is through the budget committee meetings. Um, there's always public comment at those. Uh, they will be holding public hearings. Um, and then, of course, written comment can be incorporated and submitted uh, to the city council. So. That's all I have. It's uh, just meant to serve as an overview as we move into the um, the next topic. Olivia, Thank you. Why? Am I passing Here. it over to Olivia? Yes. Yeah. Well, I wasn't sure. Do we do we want to have any questions on that section? I'm, yeah. My question to my topic sure. is total 180 on <laughs> a different topic. Yeah, but. it's very high level. <laughs> It's very quick. Um, um, do folks have any questions on the budget process, which was very educational? I'm wondering if the Planning Commission has weighed in on the city budget process in the past. So um, I, in the position that I'm in right now, 10 years, I've been staff to the commission for 10 years and the only time that i recollect the planning commission getting involved was when we provided public comment uh requesting additional resources be allocated to opcd for engagement around the conference mm -hmm. um so other than that one time in the last 10 years that's my only recollection um one of the reasons why there was discussion um over the last month about creating this kind of budget 101 is to um, share with, so that all the commissioners were aware of the opportunities for public comment on the, on the budget. And given the priorities that the planning commission has established uh, through their comment letters on the uh, comp plan, um, it was suggested that we might want to have some speaking points and some kind of paper that we're about to talk about um, and provide public comment on the budget specific to housing. Okay. And that's what Olivia is going to talk about in a moment. Okay, great. Thanks for explaining the subtext. I yeah. needed it spelled out. <laughs> and that's why we're having it. That's why we're having this conversation. So everybody's on the same page. Great. Um, can, can you go back to the timeline so I can see when the public hearing, like I'm trying to remember when the public hearings would happen if folks wanted to uh, give I don't think comment. the public hearings oh, okay I don't think the public hearings have been um advertised oh, okay. I, maybe maybe scheduled but I haven't seen any dates at this point and if people wanted to find those dates like or they wanted to submit written public comment where do they go to find the information Should be um, the City Council Select Budget Committee. Okay. Has has uh, all of their agendas are on uh, the city's website. Um, they're posted in advance with the agenda packet, and um, there should be uh, a 
an address or or something. I haven't seen that yet, but um, we can we can also track that and help with that as okay. when the time comes closer. I will okay. pop the link in the chat to um, to that website and for members of the public listening in, if you just Google Seattle City Council 2024 Select Budget Committee, um, it'll pop up. So, um, so right now there are not public hearing dates noted, nor are there future meetings indicated. Um, but we as staff will keep an eye on this and then continue to update the commission on um, when those when the public hearings are scheduled, um, as well as when the budget committee meetings will be taking place, because there will be public comment at those meetings as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Or comments? All right. I guess with that, we'll turn it over to Olivia. Okay, great. So, housing affordability paper. Uh, so, as Vanessa sort of alluded to, we've been talking about this concept for a little over a month, maybe a month and a half, but it's mostly the conversation has happened in two executive committee meetings and the last two housing and neighborhood committee meetings. So not everyone in the full commission has had the chance to hear the conversation and, and to weigh in. So the main goal for today is just to try to get everyone up to speed so everyone's on the same page um, and to, to get buy in from folks who haven't been part of the conversation yet. Um, and you know today's meetings are really since we're just at the outline stage, it's a really good time to tweak ideas if that needs to happen. Um, you know, raise any issues that you see in you know the concept so far, and and throw out um, you know concerns that you might have or questions. Um, in within the conversations, that you know at some point there was a discussion that the budget's a huge part of how things that the commission often weighs in on, like the comprehensive plan, gets implemented. Right, it, it has an important role in how a lot of the policies and plans that we all discuss um, are actually rolled out. And so there was a desire to have some sort of discussion about the budget and to weigh in. Vanessa's giving me power because um, my. My laptop is not plugged in um, and I'm running the sun show. But um, so there was an effort to or a desire to talk about the budget process, but then we had to narrow down what it was the group actually wanted to talk about um, because, you know, there's so many facets to um, how planning intersects with the budget and different topics from transportation to displacement to housing, um, you know, parks, we could go on. So the group eventually decided that, um, you know, to really prioritize, we would focus first on housing affordability um, and really zero in. Um, so as you'll see on the screen here, this is just an overview of sort of the concept behind this paper, and then I'll get into the actual outline that we've discussed so far. But the message that we zeroed in on was um, that we need as a city to protect, maintain, and grow funding for affordable housing and community stabilization programs. Um, and really the goal behind this piece is to build awareness um, within the public about, you know, housing affordability and how it intersects with the budget and to make the data on the housing crisis more approachable and relatable to everyone, even those um, who may be experiencing housing security and don't think about housing affordability on the everyday basis. Um, and the hope is to empower people to engage in the budget process and support funding for affordable housing and the programs that support community-led projects with it during the budget process. Um, so with that in mind, the audience is really folks who aren't knee-deep in um, housing affordability conversations. We know housing advocates are going to be part of this conversation. We know folks who are um, you know, avid urbanists are already part of the budget conversation and are tracking this. And so the goal is to expand to broaden the circle a little bit of people who are interested in this topic and who may be willing to um, to make public comment or to write a letter or to contact their council member on this issue during the budget cycle. Um, and so we're talking to folks who are probably um, you know curious about housing and interested in engaging, but not necessarily familiar with the process um, or don't necessarily have the tools to um, craft a statement. Um, 
And the timeline for this project, as John alluded to, um, the goal would be to try to get this out early on in the budget process. And so we're looking at a late September release date. The hope is to try to be able to utilize both of those September full commission meetings, um, but without running too late into the budget process. So we're kind of walking that line with our timeline. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of the concept behind how we got to writing a piece um, about housing affordability um, as it relates to the budget cycle. And as you'll see through the outline, it is a, a really narrow focus or compared to what the commission typically writes. Um, I think it's gonna be a different, um, different challenge for this group than what we normally work on because we are trying to keep it very high level and clear um, and simple so that it's um, really accessible to a broader range of folks than what a lot of our papers usually reach. Um, and so just as a, a sort of a mental framing, it's good for us all to remember that the pieces that the commission has already written about the comprehensive plan, about um, you know, long range planning topics related to displacement, related to transportation, the right of way, those are all still out there um, and we can definitely reference them um, and link to other references, but this document is um, a little more zeroed in and high level than what we typically write. Um, so this next slide I'm gonna show, um, it's just sort of an example. It, you don't have to try to read it. It's all sample text. It, it's all just an example. Um, but just to give you a sense of the type of layout we're, we're envisioning here. Um, and so as you can see, it's more uh, graphic heavy than what we normally write, more white space, more clarity and simplified. And so there's not a lot of text here, right? So if we're trying to produce a document that's two to three pages and is more... Um, graphics forward, it, that this is part of why we're hoping for a lighter touch um, on some of the concepts and why we're going to have to be judicious with, um, with our words and what we include. Um, so this is just to just help you visualize what, what we're talking about in terms of this paper. Moving into the actual outline, um, at the last Housing and Neighborhoods Committee meeting, we kind of um, came up with a few concepts for the introduction and the conclusion. So the introduction section would be brief, just a couple, like a paragraph or two, um, talking about, you know, why do we care about housing affordability as a city and as a community? And the thought would, was that it would be a series of statements um, about, you know, all the reasons that housing affordability is so important, um, including how it impacts everyone, how access to affordable housing can decrease the risk of homelessness, um, you know, the ways that housing stability can lead to improved health outcomes for both children and adults. It can lead to improved educational outcomes for kids. And tying in the way that investments in the production and preservation of affordable housing really impacts the broader local economy. Um, you know, it goes beyond just the individuals who are housed. And um, touching on how when we do not have enough housing, as a city, especially affordable housing, we see increased rates of displacement and disproportionate impacts to communities of color and low income households. Um, so there's a lot there, but the thought is to have that all just be as high level statements. Um, it could, we could include some links. Uh, we could have an end notes section to this piece, but these would just be sort of standalone statements that stand as they are without the typical kind of backup um, research that we often include in our papers. The next section is sort of the meat of the paper and it would be bringing in sort of the context of the housing crisis and this would be where most of the data and visuals are included in the piece. Um, I should note, I don't know if Zio is still on the call with us, but Zio very graciously offered to help with some of the graphics um, on this piece and so we've been brainstorming those. But uh, as part of the discussion today, if you have thoughts on how some of these that I'm going to touch on could look or things that definitely should be included in them, um, all those thoughts are welcome as we continue to flesh this out. Um, so within this sort of body of the piece, the context section, there was a request to include high level information on the housing gap. So um, perhaps a graphic that shows the housing unit, the production of housing units that's needed within the next 20 years, and then also indicating what percentage of that needs to be subsidized. Um, and really in as high level a way as possible, noting that the market is not going to produce this housing on its own, right? That was an important point to make since a lot of folks who are um, 
not really involved in the affordable housing crisis might not realize that um, market rate housing isn't going to get us where we need to be um, to meet the housing needs. The next section um, gets into more of the mechanics of how um, the city of Seattle is already addressing affordable housing. And so there was a desire to have um, perhaps a graphic that shows the web or system of city departments and community organizations and funding sources that come together to create affordable housing within Seattle um, and to touch on, you know, it wouldn't be comprehensive, but to try to give a sense of how broad um, the work of affordable housing really is within the city and how many hands sort of support that process. And I think the thought behind this was to, uh, especially thinking about the budget, to give people a broader sense of, you know, if you're cutting certain programs, or departments, um, it may not be as simple as keeping an eye on like the Office of Housing's budget. Um, if there are cuts made to other sections of the city budget that touch on the affordable housing sector, you know, it will it will impact the outcomes. Um, so that is one of the graphics that could be included. There was also a discussion of including a timeline of the housing development process from funding to completion, because there's been a lot of discussion about that already. Um, especially at city council sort of with questions about um, why it takes so long for projects to be built and, and what's being done with the money um, that the city's already invested. Um, and another key piece here that probably wouldn't be a graphic so much as a discussion point that would tie into those is to note the importance of funding that supports community led projects and how those investments really get amplified by the community benefits that they bring, right? So it's um, when you invest in a community-led project that is building um, multifamily housing plus other resources, not only is for folks being housed, but there are often community centers or um, important retail hubs or third spaces that are provided that are culturally relevant um, and that really um, go much further than just that initial investment of funds. And then this section would sort of conclude with a note about the housing gap that remains. So despite this complex system that's in place, we still have this housing gap. And, you know, what happens if that gap isn't addressed or is allowed to grow? Who is most impacted? So that's the meat of the paper. Again, there's a lot there, right? And so we're going to have to walk a fine line of um, providing information to make it clear and providing enough information without going too in depth on some of the topics um, to sort of lose the attention of the audience that we're aiming for. Um, and then this last slide just shows the kind of two concluding sections. So there could be a call to action sort of section that is, is essentially the so what or what, you know, what are we asking um, that could touch on what do we need to do and returning to that message of, you know, we need to protect, maintain and grow the funding for housing affordability programs in Seattle. Um, and noting that folks can get involved by following the city budget process and speaking up for programs that support this work. Um, and then the thought was to end with a closing statement that is really kind of forward looking and positive, thinking about how housing affordability brings benefits to everyone, um, kind of echoing that opening statement, um, but noting that you know abundant housing leads to a lot of these sort of beautiful concepts and um, positive outcomes like increased cultural and economic diversity, you know, better walkability and access to services. Um, housing affordability means, you know, you would have the stability to stay long term in your home and build community. You might have the ability to raise children in the city or to age in place in your home or even see, you know, children and family friends able to move back home to Seattle that have been displaced. Um, and Kind of concluding with the thought that there's a you know we have a future where all of these things are possible and they're tangible um, and we get there through building more housing and focusing on subsidized affordable housing and community-led housing projects so that's the vision for this piece um, i know you all have heard a lot of information today <laughs> and our brains are all a little mushy but um, we wanted to make sure everyone had the chance to hear what the group has been thinking, um, weigh in on this concept. So if folks want to ask questions or, um, you know, point out something that just is not working, isn't clear.
If I could just hop in to um, re thank you very much, Olivia. Olivia has been carrying this ball. Uh, and thanks to John for carrying the budget ball, so to speak. Um, just want to reiterate that the as, as we talked about this in a couple of different venues and different committee meetings, the idea is really to um, to put together a cogent, concise, and very approachable statement of why affordable housing, why it should matter to people who, who, who you know, think about going to the grocery store and think about everybody that you might encounter in the produce aisle, and how how do you how do you in a sixty seconds get somebody to understand like why is housing affordability important if if an individual isn't in subsidized housing and they happen to live in a neighborhood where housing is really stable why should it matter to them um and so that was really the driving um kind of focus between uh, behind what what we're trying to get uh, get at right here is how to make this how to make housing affordability why should it matter to everybody and the fact that housing affordability benefits everybody benefits all communities um and then just want to reiterate uh, something else that Olivia mentioned, which is we're really trying to keep the scope of this um, pretty narrow and, and understandable, given the fact that what the time frame is. So we want to put something out there in time um, for people to be able to reference it as the budget discussions begin. And then to also acknowledge that there are a number of um, allied organizations and community-based organizations and advocacy organizations who are gonna be very engaged with the budget at, at a much deeper level of detail than the paper that we are proposing putting out will be doing. So, just to help frame the conversation. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to open up the the floor for comments reactions questions um, please drop your name in the chat um, and i think i might prioritize calling on people who don't sit in the housing and neighborhoods committee so we can garner reactions from people who haven't had a chance to be part of this discussion so far diana you did drop a question in the chat box um, earlier do you want to ask that question yeah, and, you know, understanding we want to stay to a discrete, you know, succinct, efficient message. Um, I think even if we don't have, like, a contextualized box, some some kind of message that allows to more robustly uh, elaborate on the complexity of this policy, like, that we're not just trying to provide oversimplified solutions, that there are they're layered elements to this and like, you know, a true affordable housing policy uh, and funding for it would have to be very nuanced. And here, you know, the commission is providing what we think are the most salient approaches to this, but that it's not an exhaustive list. I think that would just be helpful to kind of share that we understand that there could be more creative solutions to propose, right? but that this paper is not intended to answer all of those topics. So as an example, you know, you know, what percentage, and I don't know that we know this, this data, right? What percentage of, uh, of the in-house population suffers of addiction and how, it, you know, is that something that is, I guess I don't know this, right? Does that preclude someone from, um, accessing affordable housing right and what are we doing about that population of so so i don't know that answer um because i'm not um knowledgeable enough but what does that mean for what the broad population perceives as being part of the homelessness crisis in this city right the majority of them are um folks that either experience addiction or severe mental health issues right and how is that being tackled for the population to perceive that like, hey, I'm going to put in tax dollars to alleviate this issue and it will also alleviate the issues that I experience daily on the street. So not trying to say that we want to tackle, you know, the complexity of the issue, but it just seems like then it might, you know, whatever we 
show us progress, is that going to be felt at the neighborhood level with people? And I can just speak to my personal experience living in Capitol Hill. My particular block is one that is, you know, uh, I, I, my unsheltered neighbors are all mostly folks that experience severe addiction or mental health, uh, have severe mental health issues. So just curious on how we are intending to nuance or at least comment on it to keep it broad, not necessarily go into it, but acknowledge it. Um, the first thing that's coming to mind for me with this question, Diana, is um, maybe a tie-in with this graphic that we're talking about that touches on um, the web or system of city departments and organizations that play a role in affordable housing. So maybe there's a note about like the human services department and the many services that they provide to specifically unhoused communities in Seattle and how that ties in with like addiction services programs and the services that they provide, right? So they are part of that housing um, solution within the city and part of the process. Um, yeah, ecosystem. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jamie. Yeah, I think I think one of the challenges is like we're trying to keep this to like two pages and <laughs> and I think within that um, uh, the issue of houselessness is is so, like you could do an entire issue paper just on that topic. And I think like um, what we were trying to do with this outline was to really highlight the issue at a at kind of a higher level and at like a big picture scale. Um, I think because this is something that we are dealing with, that's like at a city council level, um, we also have to be kind of um, wary about the conversation getting steered down a rabbit hole and wanting to make sure that folk, that you know, the point where we want to get across of that just there simply isn't enough housing, period, let alone for folks struggling with mental illness or uh, addiction. Right. Um, and so how do we how do we kind of drive home here are all the existing programs and here are all the big gaps um, in addition to that? And, you know, if we if we want to do a focus on the the um, the challenge, particularly for our, our houseless folks, um, that could be um, that could be another paper we do where we dig further deeper into that um, particular issue. I think I'm not saying it's that we shouldn't mention it. I just think like we should do so in a way where we can um, keep the focus on on the larger, bigger, bigger issue that we're trying to highlight for the council. Yeah, no, Jamie, I agree with you just to respond very quickly. What I was trying to mention is I, I'm unaware and maybe, you know, in our pool of expertise in the commission, we we understand if there are barriers to access to uh, affordable housing for folks with addiction and mental illness, right? If there are, you know, distinct barriers to that kind of access, what the regular layman's, you know, kind of like neighborhood community experiences is that those are the kind of populations that are most visibly, you know, uh, not accessing, you know, housing. And so if that is the case, that is kind of the point I'm trying to make sure we, we mention because in terms of even like politically, right, uh, you make a, a, a you know, a, a decision about funding and taxes, et cetera, and what people experience on day to day on the streets doesn't feel commensurate on what the, how they are experiencing the homelessness crisis, right? Then that's where I wanted to kind of draw the pinpoint of saying this is focused on this, uh, knowing that there's challenges and barriers for these communities, mm -hmm. which are like by and large what who people experience on the street, right? Ergo, separate topic, not topic of this paper but acknowledging it. Well, I, I guess, think I, some, go ahead, Jimmy. 
I'm just, I guess I'm not really following what you think the, um, uh, like, like if we, if we are focusing on what are the, the things that most people are experiencing day to day around housing affordability, like, is that, is that what you're kind of saying we should focus on? Yeah, no, I'm saying our paper is about that, right? We should also acknowledge what people, when when these you know, when we're asking council to make these decisions and changes in policy and funding, right? They are tied to political decisions, which are kind of related to how normal people that don't understand, you know, the complexity, et cetera, like tie in the issue, how politicians are addressing it, and then how it gets addressed. And, you know, making sure and, and again this is i guess it's more of a question and maybe someone has the answer is there specific barriers right to access affordable housing for people with severe addiction and mental health i don't know that that's the case i assume that is the case i don't know that it's the case so our paper is not geared to tackling that problem right but one of the solutions to removing those barriers is to create vastly more permanent supportive housing. So, you know, housing alone is not going to untangle and address and solve the fentanyl crisis. It's not going to magically create the mental health resources that we need across the state and right. the nation. But there are things that community-based organizations through the Equitable Development Initiative and organizations mm -hmm. that tap into funding from the Seattle Office of Housing and organizations looking to utilize the incentives that OPCD is trying to roll out through like zoning incentives and land use incentives through the comprehensive plan. All of those are going to play a role in increasing housing supply and increasing mm -hmm. The type of housing that's permanent supportive housing where people who really need that additional support um, have the permanent support, the, per the housing that's permanent for them and mm -hmm. the services that are attached. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think there's part of that. It's kind of a complex question of folks mm -hmm. accessing housing with drug addiction. Um, you know, there, there's a range of things that serve as barriers for barriers for folks in terms of accessing housing that extend beyond just the fact that they need services in order to thrive and remain stably housed. Um, but I think the real challenge will be threading the needle of acknowledging it, but not in two pages when we're really talking about budget, about not going down that, but I, I think what Deanna is trying to do is to say, these are the kinds of conversations that average folks are having in Seattle. And so how do we, how do we be, be aware of that as we think through how we put together the framing of the paper, of the paper. It's like a handout. I don't really know what, I don't know right. if paper is the right <laughs> term. Like a name, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. But I appreciate I you elevating really it. And, thank and you, I think, too. Yeah, yeah, and I think we well we can navigate our way through the the edits, right? I think staff can take yeah. this back and work through it. That's my thought, and I'm really really sorry, Monica, for talking over you. Um, so you are welcome to disagree with me. You're welcome to continue the conversation on this thread. I'm very sorry about that. Don't be sorry. I was actually <laughs> I I was going to say something along those lines of like there are these housing first initiatives and there are sets of initiatives that are really directed at that population, and it seems like that isn't exactly what we're trying to target with this paper, and also. I see what Deanna is saying about if people are expecting this to talk about the universe of housing in Seattle and we don't touch on the homelessness situation at all, that might seem like an oversight. So, I mean, I guess you're exactly right. Just finding the balance of, you know, we like we recognize the homelessness crisis. We're talking more specifically about the affordability crisis, like, you know, like there and also like we recognize it as a complex ecosystem and we're not, you know, we can't we can't solve everything in two pages. You know, I mean, just, I, you know, how we, how transparent we are about that, I think is always valuable. Um, and thank you for raising that, Deanna. Thanks, Monica. You nailed it. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Um, I'm going to circle then back to Lauren, who's going to take us in a different direction, a practical direction. Yeah. She had the discussion. Um, I'm just going to be really like straightforward, like, our, is our objective in writing this because we are worried about the resourcing of housing and our 
our recommendations today as a part of this budget conversation. I mean, I'm fully aware of the city budget status and um, are we as a planning commission just interested in putting all of our chips like on the table to say this is the most important thing to protect right now and here's why and here's what the you know kind of lowest common denominator human living in Seattle needs to understand and that should inform any engagement on the budget like is that why we're saying like we're producing a housing affordability fact sheet to inform budget conversations or is there a different objective that I'm just like kind of missing I can jump in and provide a little context and then I'll definitely invite um, others who were part of this sort of burgeoning discussion um, uh, over the last couple of weeks. And please correct me if I'm not, um, if, if my perception is wrong. I believe there are a number of commissioners who are concerned about um, a proposed amendment to this year's budget that would have provisoed the EDI funds and really saw that the EDI program, EDI and associated programs may really be at risk okay. um, as we move into the budget cycle. Yeah. We started the conversation talking about, you know, how are we going to engage with the mayor's proposed plan after it comes out uh -huh. end of this year, beginning of next year. And then in that conversation, we realized we may want to be actually yeah. engaging in the budget yeah. before we in, engage in the comp plan conversation, okay. because if there is an adequate resources in the budget, it's 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 unfortunate that the budget is coming before the is is yeah the tail of the budget is wagging the dog of the comp plan because totally. the budget is a two year process, totally. the comp plan is a twenty year vision. So yeah, um, but I invite not but and I definitely invite um, others on the call who were part of these. Uh, the past conversations over the past couple couple of weeks to um, to either say I was wrong or I was completely off base. <laughs> That's clear enough to me, and thank you for saying it like that. And I would almost look to us to be more forthright about that. Housing affordability to me, like we've been in a housing affordability crisis for the entire time I've been on the planning commission, and I'm sorry to say that I'm like a bit desensitized to it. Because it, because we, feel, I feel powerless slash impacted by it, you know. And Diana, I'm appreciating your points of like maybe someone's everyday experience of housing affordability is not only their own mortgage or rent check, but like seeing houseless neighbors like struggling and like human agony on the streets. So it's like, okay, what? How do I engage with this? I think that we can really target are like I'm now I'm now catching up thank you everybody for you know bearing with me here but like all of the good work that we have done on the comp plan on our comment letters on really centering equitable de equitable equitable development and how our values as a city translate into our budget like that's what I want to see this be about I don't want it to just be like housing affordability is important I want it to be like not obviously we aren't like activists you can't just like tell be as forthright maybe as I would be in my personal life but to be able to say like something is at risk here yeah something is at risk here and it's not the 20-year growth plan that is in the comp plan that also is at risk it is the resourcing for the immediate needs of our city just to say if we don't do this now we are two more years down the road and that's what that means like this is what this means maybe we grounded in the near-term reality of housing need and i love the idea of kind of showing the picture the pie chart whatever it is of frankly all of the supports needed it's office of housing it's king county it's it's all of it i'm not a housing professional but just to be able to say like this is it this is at risk Here's some things to think about. And if we invest here, these are the outcomes that we are investing in. You know, I just, I think the way that this presentation is, is worded, I, it was just kind of going over my head, but now I see it in the link of everything that we have been working on and working towards as a part of the comp plan to see it undermined by this administration. Yeah. And now we're entering a budget process that I'm, I fear will be characterized by the same 
things, you know? So I, I see the, I now see the strategic kind of message and moment that we are entering into. And I would invite us to maybe think about more targeted language around, I don't, I don't necessarily know if equitable development is the right thing. I don't need that to be divisive or maybe to speak towards a, something that may or may not happen, but just, um, you know, this is, this is, these are our priority steps around maintaining an equitable, inclusive Seattle. And it means tangibly investing in these things, you know? So. Thanks. So. Yeah. Reactions to that. Rose. I love it. Deanna. <laughs> Thanks, Deanna Martin. loves it. Love it. Go ahead, Rose. Okay. <laughs> I was like cleaning. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, and Lauren to provide added context because I was at one of the early exact sessions where we started talking about this. Um, and, and my suggestion portion is we had definitely talked about, well, who is who are we to get involved with the Seattle Planning Commission? Our mandate is related to the comp plan, right? And my suggestion is to make it clear that part of stewarding the comp plan is making sure that things are yeah. being followed through, right? <laughs> and so my suggestion would be to make it clear that like affordable housing has been a long-term objective of the city for a long time. And like you said, Lauren, what's at stake is the immediacy, but it's been a long thing. So um, I think just reemphasizing that we, the Seattle Planning Commission, our role is related directly to the comp plan and how that translates yeah. to the budget process is important. We cannot forget to include that link in my mind. Yeah. In a way that people understand, because not everybody understands what a comprehensive plan is. Yeah. And so in lay people's terms to explain what is at risk. If you don't mind, I, I want to do a time check because in my mind I thought our meeting went till 530, but my speaker's notes say 520. So <laughs> Vanessa, can I invite you to um, weigh in and tell me? Absolutely. Thank you. I, okay. I couldn't type fast enough. Uh, <laughs> yes, our meeting officially ends at 520. Um, okay. I don't want to curb the conversation, but I, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time who were who might have been planning on yeah. including at 520. So right. I suggest maybe we take five more minutes to yeah. wrap things up. Um, and I think this has been a great conversation. I, I, I feel like we've got some good, great direction. Yeah, I, I personally feel like what Lauren has said and what Rose has said, and I think that moves us in the right direction. Um, I frankly was having a hard time connecting this framing that we came up with back to like our role as stewards of the comprehensive plan and kind of the case statement for what's at risk. And I would broaden that risk to not just the equitable development initiative, but the city is going to face really difficult decisions around staffing in departments that don't generate revenue, like the Office of Planning and Community Development. And there's also revenue sources that uh, could potentially be reallocated, um, such as the jumpstart tax away from housing and towards other things. And so if we, if we ha believe in this, if we buy into this long-term vision for the comprehensive plan, it starts with investing in that future today. And so, yeah. um, I, anyway, I, 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 th I think it resonates. I think before staff go forth and do some amendments, I just want to check with the rest of the group to make sure everybody would be okay with this shift in direction. And again, disagreement is totally fine because it's in the points of tension where we come up with our best work. So um, Nick is saying, OK. Michaela, I would offer a friendly amendment that I don't think yes. it's a shift. I think it's an evolution and a honing. Honing, and, an and improvement. Wrapping yes. us back to the mission of the Planning <laughs> Commission as stewards yeah. of the comprehensive plan and making that direct link. Thank you yeah. so much, Rose. That makes um, thanks everybody who, who weighed in because I, I do feel like it's really coming <laughs> together what we're trying to do now. So, 
Oh, and uh, I, I have to say out loud for the record that um, Lauren just came up with hashtag invest in the vision. So tweet that now, get it out there in the zeitgeist. Can I just ask the group if in the time that we have left, um, given that there hasn't a lot of new ideas pulled out just here in the last like five minutes, yeah. um, you know, in an effort to be able to draft for this by the next time we see everyone, because we're looking at maybe not really talking as a full group again until September 12th. Um, how, how do we think this main message has evolved? I think just like as staff, what we'll need to be able to take this forward is at least a really solid message that the group wants to go us around and we can fill in the rest. Um, so how has this message evolved? What would you add? What would you change? Are we, is this not relevant at all? And the message is because we're stewards of the comprehensive plan the planning commission cares about the budget more broadly? What, what are your thoughts? I think it's exactly the invest in the vision. Like this is the first step towards moving toward our vision for a sustainable, inclusive, equitable city. And like, here's what the breakdown of the budget to date has been. And these are the outcomes we're getting. So we, we need to grow the pie. Like to me, it's, it feels simple like that. Like here's the types of things that support equitable, ha inclusive housing choices in our city. Like even just a simple pie chart, here's, here's the players and the types of things they do. And so like continue to grow, continue to grow this. Like it's not like a stasis or cut, it's a grow. And we get these outcomes collectively. But to me, linking it to the money, linking it to the budget was kind of what I was missing. And even just an educational thing of like, here's the proportion of the city budget that kind of goes to stuff like this, you know. So maybe bring in a little more of the money as y'all deem appropriate. Jamie? Lauren oh. just said what I was gonna say. <laughs> Monica. I just want to say, too, there have been some really great letters written by community leaders regarding EDI and some there have been some really incredible. There's been some amazing organizing and some some really beautiful statements made on the EDI budget change, which I can try and find some of them and share them. But I think that it's useful to kind of, you know, like reflect the community voice that is already advocating for this specifically. You're getting a thumbs up. Can I ask that you forward that on to Vanessa? Yes, and she can. Thank you. Lauren, do you want the final word? No. No. <laughs> okay. Sorry for jumping the queue. I get carried away by my person. No, it's okay. I, I prefer discourse, which can sometimes uh, uh, be feel a little out of order. Um, <laughs> well, everybody, I, I think I'm going to um, wrap us up. Really, really, really appreciate this meeting. My brain is full of content um and uh full of hope for what's ahead of us as a city um and uh um yeah just wanted to appreciate folks for staying long on a hot august afternoon michaela and diana um, yeah, yeah just really quick um you know i had like not you know they're not major comments i'm sure they're not necessarily going to make it to the severia plan but uh so my understanding is Vanessa's going to try to find a time before uh, to meet with uh, Jesse and team right for those various plans to provide a, you know, a few more comments. They're not, you know, mine, mine were around economic development and tourism and how that is being addressed in the Severia plan, you know, short term rental housing. Why is that not? thought about in a Severia plan, you know, the amount of Airbnbs versus hotel rooms versus those kinds of things um, and how that impacts housing availability, right? Like that's why I care about it. Um, and, but tourism being the motor of downtown um, and really what I see is a justification for saying let's improve downtown significantly and the tension between that and where people want to live and the lack of open space and the complacency with just the amount of open space that there that exists in downtown so just curious how that's being tackled in the sub area plans or how you know is being thought of to frame further creative opportunities for open space in any case just wondering what is going to be our path as a commission to provide those kinds of comments because it took me a little bit 
to collect my thoughts uh, just in the time that we were receiving the information and my ability to articulate those comments and questions. Vanessa, my feeling is that this commission probably has a lot of thoughts, similar, you know, detailed thoughts. They presented a lot of detailed information, and I think that deserves time for us to sort of react to it and contribute to it. Um, and our committee meetings might be a great venue to bring them back in. And let's at this meeting, we're going to talk about this plan. Here's the information that you can have in advance. They can come with some pre prepared questions that they have us think about in advance, like the ones that they said today when I asked them how we could be helpful. And perhaps commissioners could also submit some questions so we could have a facilitated and effective discussion in the meeting. Um, as I think, and when I was in our interviews and I was telling new commissioners, potential new commissioners, about what we do. In the talking points that were prepared for me, we are not just stewards of the comprehensive plan, but we are also stewards of these sub area plans. Is that correct, mm -hmm. Vanessa? Stewards of all plans. Of all plans. <laughs> 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 so uh, it, it just seems appropriate that we would be more than briefed on the sub area plans, but that we would be a stakeholder that would be um, engaged and, and that we would have lots of interesting ideas to and expertise to contribute to those conversations, mm -hmm. particularly since we live in some of these neighborhoods that were under discussion today. So plus one. And I, think, I think today's discussion is a great entree for me to be able to go back to Erica and Jesse and say, wow, Commissioners were really interested in everything you had to say. I'd love to put the deck in front of them, give them time to percolate, to digest, and let so I can engage them more actively on what is their timeline. When would we? When would it be most helpful? When do they have the ability to meet yeah. with us again? And certainly, we would hope that that would be before the plans themselves, the drafts, become developed. Yeah, I think we would rather influence the drafts, you know, inform mm -hmm. the drafts rather and be consulted yeah. on that and in this stage rather than once the pen gets put to paper. And to help, you know, so to yeah, help. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, to help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Deanna. Appreciate you bringing that back up just to make sure we had clarity on a path forward there. Thank you. Um, all right, everybody, I am going to adjourn us now. Um, at 5.30 on August 8th, that concludes our meeting. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.